Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Council. This is where we gather, readers and writers gather. For writers, it's to learn the craft. It's to improve the craft. This is where we learn from published novelists and book doctors and so on and so forth. And for readers, we introduce you to some great novelists, some great writers. And today, in the spotlight, the person I have in the spotlight is going to serve both of your purposes in spades. In the spotlight is Phoebe Fox, and she is quite a veteran of the business. I'm going to sample her bio for you. Not only is she a novelist and a book editor, for many years she's been a book editor, so she's going to be able to tell us what, what we do wrong with on manuscripts, what kind of things she needs to fix, what makes a manuscript agent ready or editor ready. And, uh, and then on top of that, her writing of novels, and she's just out with a new one that I'll tell you about in a minute, and she's going to read a sample from, as a matter of fact. And that new novel, uh, the, I mean, just the fact that she's a novelist, she understands the writing life. She doesn't just tear apart our work. She does her own work. And I remember years ago, I heard Julia Cameron in a in a um, interview. It was a uh, audio, a, a video or audio interview. I don't remember which, but she said, never work with a writing coach or editor who isn't writing because... If they're not writing, they've got a very powerful internal sensor, and that's why they're not writing. And they will turn that sensor on you, and they will be scurrilous in the way they – she did my word, not hers. I mean, they're going to be caustic. Let's say that's a better word. A cost, they're going to be caustic and looking at your writing and probably be hypercritical. So something to uh, keep in mind. Matter of fact, uh, I have an invite out to Julia Cameron. hope to have her on a future edition here, uh, hopefully in January. Now. Not only is Phoebe Fox a novelist and a book editor, she's a regular columnist for national, regional, local publications, things like the Huffington Post, which we've all heard of, Elite Daily, and a publication also called She Knows. Uh, she also just last month wrote an article for Writer's Digest, which um, we're going to take time to go through a little bit of that with her because the headline on the article is Five Tips for Using Personal Stories in Your Writing. So Phoebe Fox is going to get us up to speed on the do's and don'ts of that. She's also a former actor on stage and screen. She's been suspended from wires as a mall fairy. She was accidentally concussed by a blank gun, which has special relevance considering what just happened with Alec Baldwin and, and the whole movie set at Rust. Thank God it was just a concussion and nothing more severe. Uh, she hosted a short-lived game show. And she has been a relationship columnist, uh, a movie theater, a, a movie theater and book reviewer, uh, and a radio personality. She's also a close observer of relationships in the wild. And we're going to have to ask her what she means by in the wild. Uh, now, she currently lives in Austin, Texas, where she works hard to keep Austin weird. That is the city slogan, believe it or not, keep Austin weird. She lives there with her husband of... Uh, I don't know how many years, but I will tell you this. She had many action-packed years of dating before she met the right guy, and that is very much what she's all about, what she writes about, her relationship books. She also has two uh, dogs that, that combined weigh 175 pounds, <laughs> a Pyrenees and a Shepherd mix. I think I got all that correct, uh, but I don't need to worry about that because in the house we have Phoebe Fox, and before I actually – invite her to begin speaking if she hasn't fallen asleep yet on me. Uh, her latest novel is called The Way We Weren't, a play on The Way We Were, I assume, the Redford Streisand movie of yesteryear, which, which, which really is pretty much a classic. Before that, she wrote a novel called A Little Bit of Grace. She also has a series of books called The Breakup Doctor, uh, one of which is titled The Breakup Doctor. It's called The Breakup Doctor series. And one of the books is titled The Breakup Doctor. Then she has one called Bedside Manners as part of that series, and, and also one called Heart Conditions. Uh, Phoebe Fox, um, you know, I'm already getting an inferiority complex reading your bio, but I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm going to say welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Thank you, Mike. That was an absolutely forensic introduction. I'm so <laughs> impressed with your thoroughness. You can and cancel also your with, doctor's appointment. <laughs> I tell you what, and also that you use the word scurrilous. You've now made my day because you don't. You just don't hear it enough. 
You know, we're writers. We need to have a good vocabulary, but not not use words indiscriminately. Notice I corrected it, though, Phoebe. I realized that it, I was overstating it. And I, <laughs> I scaled it back to caustic. So, Which is another that's fun one. A good edit- there you go. I, 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 that's what an editor needs to do, a writer needs to do when they go into self-editing mode is, is this really an accurate word or not? <laughs> yes. So, is that what I meant to say? <laughs> so before we get to, well, I have to ask you, we have a close observer of relationships in the wild. That sounds like <laughs> sex in the city, perhaps. I mean, what's the wild? Oh, that was just me being goofy because I did date for a long time. I met my husband, my now husband, when I was 39 years old. And uh, I, I joke that I introduce him as my first husband and he introduces me as his current wife. Um, <laughs> but we met very late in life for me anyway. Uh, he was 45. And so it just felt like I'd had a very, very rich and real dating life up until then. And I also had a whole bunch, and still do, had a whole bunch of single friends. And so I've just always been fascinated with relationships and love to know what makes them tick, not just romantic ones, although they are fascinating to me, but all of our relationships. It is really one of the themes of all of my writing, um, family so particularly. Were, I'm sorry, finish that, that sentence. I interrupted you. Fam, that's okay. Family particularly uh, is a relationship I am endlessly fascinated by. Yes. And the most interesting relationships to me when I read fiction, when I read literature, I want dysfunctional relationships are way more interesting than, than leave it to beaver type of uh, family units. So um, I did, uh, you know, your, your single friends, I, I imagine that you have to kind of tell them, hey, look, I kissed a lot of frogs before I found Prince Charming. Um, so, you know, do they lose kind of lose heart a little bit, uh, just because they're out there dating and they're having trouble finding a, a lifelong companion? I, you know, it seems to have shifted for me to some degree. Like I never, I didn't know if I was going to get married. Um, I was really happy. I bought a house, <laughs> you know, and I, I had great friends and a great career. And I actually was considering adopting kids on my own and um, felt like it wasn't the time for that yet, right when I met my husband. And I think a lot of my friends, especially at our age now, we are what is euphemistically called women of a certain age. And I think you just get to a point where you, if it happened, that would have been lovely. You know, it's really nice to share your life with someone, but also if it doesn't happen, I think you can still find, you know, there's so much in life that is fulfilling beyond that. I have a whole bunch of girlfriends who, who are single and have, we joke about our little commune that <laughs> that we're going to form <laughs> because you do kind of, you make each other your support network in, in a similar way that you would with any partner, I think, except I you can know, sexually, the, if that's not your bag. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine the novelistic ideas you get from your friends. And I can also imagine your husband throwing one of your books on the floor and saying, that's me in that book. You're writing about me again. Well, why did you say that about me? Do you ever use your husband as inspiration? I use everybody as inspiration. Doesn't every doesn't every yes. creative do that? Like everything's yes. fair game. Exactly. exactly. Not that you're stealing now, it, but you get inspired by it. And you seriously, this is what I mean by like close observer of relationships in the wild. I think so many of us who are particularly writers, creatives in general, but writers specifically, I think that's that's the basis of great story is character. And how do you create character? You have to be very observant of the characters in your life. And you said uh, not to s- steal it. And that uh, falls right into line with this article that you wrote for Writer's Digest. So just for our listeners, I, wanna, I want to um, kind of foreshadow. I'll use the writing t- uh, technique of foreshadowing here. We're going to have uh, Phoebe talk to us about these tips about using personal stories. We're going to talk about her work as a book editor and learn some lessons there. And then we're also going to talk to her about her latest piece of work and, and the breadth of her career and have her read uh, an excerpt from her, her latest novel. So uh, in that article, again, five tips for using personal stories in your writing subtitle says, when you draw inspiration from your own experiences, what you use is fair game. But if it's about someone else, question mark, uh, here, author Phoebe Fox shares five tips for using personal stories in her writing. 
What about those five tips? In fact, maybe this is what I'll do. I'm just going to read them off quickly, and then you elaborate on each one, one by one. Okay, Phoebe. fine. So Writers love nothing more than this, you know, to elaborate really, on our ideas. It's nirvana. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so number one, do no harm. That sounds like almost being a doctor, number yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. That was my little riff <laughs> on that. Um, so I, I well, think you have to examine let me, let me your- just go, Let me just run through them. Number okay. two is change or obscure the details. And then number three is tell a story, not the history. Number four is make sure it's your story to tell. And number five, ask permission. So I just want to get those out there so uh, to kind of whet their appetite and now uh, have you elaborate, starting with number one, do no harm. Do no harm. So there was this article that ran, uh, was it in the New York Times called, Who is the Bad Art Friend? No, it was like Vanity Fair or something like that. The Atlantic. I don't even know. But I don't know if you read it. It created such a furor in the writing community, in the creative community, because the center of it was really about what... So there was a legal question and an ethical question in it. And the legal one was, what is plagiarism? But I think the one that was really captivating writers particularly was what is ethically okay in, and I'm putting this in air quotes, borrowing details from Mm -hmm. lives that we observe. And the thing is, we all do it. Honestly, if there's a writer who tells you that they don't, I'm going to say they're lying. I'm calling BS Mm -hmm. on that. Because how else would you write? You know what I mean? We have to draw from life. You draw from, yes, your imagination, but it's sparked by the paradigm you have to your feet planted in, and that is the world around you. (laughs) So We all borrow elements from other people's lives, from our own lives, from our loved ones' lives. What, How you do that and why you do that is important. One of the central things in this article was that one of the women who, again, air quoting here, borrowed a story that had happened to another woman, allegedly did it with ill intentions. Uh, there was a comment by somebody involved that she did it to take this woman down. So if you're doing it as some sort of a vendetta or to humiliate somebody or uh, call them out, I, I don't think that that's a valid reason to use it in your writing. And I think mm-hmm. that's ethically shady. Yes. Number two is change or obscure the details. You know, I sometimes, I mean, I use real life characters in what I've written, and one was a comedic novel, and I car- and I turn them into caricatures. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's not the same as obscuring the details, but changing them anyway. What's your take on this? And uh, as you're as you're doing this, this is the kind of stuff that you do in your own novels, correct? Yeah, I had I have a horrific experience with this. Um, I was writing, oh. I think, my first breakup doctor novel. And, you know, as you do as a writer, you're a, basically you're a sponge. And so somebody had told me a story about someone they knew who I didn't know uh, and a, a crisis she was going through in her life. And this had been at least a year before I wrote Breakup Doctor, maybe more. And so as I'm writing it, I took a minor character and I gave her what I thought was a story loosely based on and inspired by this story. Well, it turned out when I finished it and it was all but in print, uh, my friend, thank goodness, read it and was horrified because apparently I got it pretty much detail for detail exactly right. I had no idea my memory was so good. So um, this woman was entirely recognizable in a way that would have been hurtful for her. And that was never my intention. And so luckily we were able to go in and I just altered all the details. The way I think I talked about it was if, you know, let's say you're writing about an experience of, I don't know, having, having an alcohol, loving an alcoholic, let's say this is totally, um, I'm spitballing. This is not based in reality. That's my disclaimer. And, and you, if you actually, let's say your spouse is an alcoholic, that's going to be a little close to home. So maybe you could, if what you want to write about is loving somebody who has an addiction, give them a different addiction. If you want to write about somebody who um, is unable to overcome a challenge that is hampering your relationship with them, maybe make it 
uh, I don't know, let it be a physical impairment. Let it be, uh, you know, that they're stuck in a regret and they can't let go of that and it colors everything. So change, you know, make it a different relationship, make it a different gender, change enough things that it won't be instantly recognizable, not only to the person, but to the people in your lives. It's always astonishing to me that when you do write a character that you've drawn maybe a little bit more from a character, from someone in your life, and you're terrified that they're going to think, oh man, that's me and be mad. They never recognize themselves. And yet when you don't, like they'll recognize themselves in characters that you had no intention of being not only not them, but not anybody really. They're an amalgam. So mm, you can't control that, but you can make it not quite so pointed. Yeah. And what you're talking about here is so simple to do. You're changing really the relationship or changing the addiction is not... It's not a, a big writing task. So, um, I mean, you're a writer, uh, so right? Use your imagination. That. Don't draw directly from life. You're not transcribing life. You're Absolutely. what ifing. You're riffing on life. You're taking <laughs> that's something that really is <laughs> happening. That's what I love and to do is riff. riff. Yeah. Yes. That's why I like the podcast. I like to riff. And, uh, you know, it's so much harder to do it in writing. I've always had a little bit of a block in terms of trying to make it more conversational or more of a riff. But, we continue. This is why uh, writing is, you know, you never stop learning. You never stop uh, uh, yeah. trying to that's, achieve new things in it. That's so the number internal three editor. Is, that, that sucker yes. gets in your way. Yes. All of our way. <laughs> you know, and sometimes a mindset goes to, I'm writing a novel. Let's sound like a novel. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. It it. Yeah, and you lose your voice. The yeah, they're, they're, it's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Number three, tell a story, not a history. Right. I think I just covered that one. You're, you're not transcribing life. That's not your job as a writer. Your job is to create a what if story, you know, based on maybe something that inspired it in real life, but then you take that and you run with it. Use your creativity, <laughs> basically. And, you know, when, when I see not a history, I also think in terms of not trying to overwrite. In other words, tell, you see too often people write a lot of background about the character right mm -hmm. out front there. And then it's kind of like, uh, to begin with, do I really know, need to know this much about that person? And do I need to know it in one big inf uh, yeah, word dump? Or yes. should that be you know, woven into the tale? Yeah, so, I always say four. approach backstory with the Watergate question. What does the reader need to know and when do they need to know it? And just exactly. brush stroke that information in as we need it, or you risk the story feeling backward looking and losing momentum. Now, make sure, number four, make sure it's your story to tell. Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because we might be peripherally involved. Let's go back to the example, the entirely hypothetical example that I just used about, let's say you have an alcoholic spouse. That does affect you, but it also affects the person that you're writing about. Is that your story to tell? So you, are you writing the story of what it's like to experience alcoholism. Well, that's not a really good example. Let's say, okay, here, I'll use another example from my own writing. My last book, A Little Bit of Grace. I had a character whose lived experience was entirely foreign to mine. And I wanted to present it accurately and sensitively and authentically. And so I spoke with a woman whose lived experience it was, but I kept this character as a secondary supporting character. The main journey of the story was the protagonists, who I, I was in a more uh, authoritative position to write about just because, you know, that's more my life experience. So I wanted to get it right, but I would never have dreamed of trying to tell this woman's story. It's one of the things I think we're seeing now with... Um, I, gosh, I know own voices is sort of out of favor right now, and I'm not sure how we're referring to it, but we need more stories told by the people whose stories they are. We need black stories told by black authors. We need immigrant stories told by immigrants. We need, you know, Muslim stories told by Muslims and not to appropriate those stories. And so that's what I meant by that point. Tell the story mm -hmm. that you're equipped to tell. And that doesn't mean you can't bring in elements of those. Um, areas that are outside your direct experience, but don't try to co-opt a life experience that you don't have the, the um, 
I guess, moral authority <laughs> to, pre to present, right, right. you know, you're edging out somebody whose story that actually is to tell. Now, what do you know about the controversy over American Dirt, correct? Yeah, that's the exactly what that I was just out? thinking about. Yeah. Now, do you think she did that? Or do you think that, that it was a, um, it was a okay performance just in terms of that she didn't, I mean, did she violate number four or do you <laughs> think that she had, that she had it right? So I have not read it, but I've read a lot about it. And what I have read about it, and, you know, granted, these are, everybody's got their own perspective. So I may have read somebody else's perspective on this, but it seemed to me that um, one of the main objections I heard about that story was that parts of it were, and again, this is, is it legal or is it ethical? Parts of it were lifted from another Mexican author's writings that did not ever gain popularity in this country. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah. Okay. And again, I, I, please don't quote me on this. I don't know this firsthand and I don't know it as fact, but I did read that that was uh, the objection that some people had. And I believe the author is a Puerto Rican of Puerto Rican descent, but distantly and presented herself as having direct experience. And again, I could be wrong about that, but I think that was also an objection that a lot of people had was she was sort of claiming, oh no, I'm, you know, I've, I'm of Hispanic origin. And so this is my story to tell, but hers is very different. But you know, this also brings up to me a bigger question of, I actually write about this a lot in my editorial capacity. How much do we limit ourselves as writers? Because ultimately this is a creative field and people look like everything and our lives are touched by hopefully all different walks of people. And are we, if we're confined to our very narrow lane of our direct lived experience, that really puts shackles on creativity in a way. I don't know how I feel about yeah. that. <laughs> no, I don't like that at all. You got to remember, we're writing fiction, which means that it can be magical realism. It can be fantasy. It can be sci-fi. Mm -hmm. It can be warfare. And now, just to be clear with our listeners who might not be familiar with American Dirt, this is a... a, a an author, she's got, I guess, okay, so she's at least part Puerto Rican. She's got a, a, a Caucasian last name, I believe. I forget her name right now, but do you yeah. know it, Phoebe? No, I can't. I can't think of it off the top of my head. So check me on this because I haven't read it either. We're just it's, smack talking it's, it's, it's this poor woman. We don't even yes, know her name. Yes, yes. I mean, my God, she can smack <laughs> talk back though if she wants to. But here's the thing though. I mean, she was writing about a, uh, the uh, immigrant experience, I think at the border, mm -hmm. grueling immigrant experience. Some people said, she wasn't qualified right about that because she's never lived it. She's not even Hispanic. Well, yes, she is a, at least a little bit, but probably never had that experience. But again, I just, I, I have a hard time imagining that fiction writers aren't free to write fiction. Isn't that mm -hmm. what it's about? Now, and this is another kind of issue that you get into when you write a novel that's supposed to be a something where I'm going to take on a big issue and I'm going to write about it authoritatively. And it's going to be about something that's hot right now in the news, which is immigration, uh, refugees trying to cross the border, the abuse of them and so on. Um, I would think that a lot of people would just would say, I'm glad she's bringing attention to it for crying out loud. Now, lifting yeah. writing for, from another author. I mean, I, I don't, like you said, you don't know, I don't know, but it, it, that's part of the accusation. Um, so you are about to say, well, one thing I think about on that, I agree with you. And one thing I think about on that note is, you know, I think, I think story has the power to change the world. I think it has over and over. We Absolutely. see that. I mean, I, I come back to something as simple as one reason I think gay marriage became the law and we got equal civil rights is that we storytellers kept showing us gay people in a way that made them not other. You know, they brought them into our living rooms. They brought them into our homes if some of us maybe weren't exposed to that. And you can't, I don't think you can hate a human being. I think you can hate a concept. And so in many ways, over and over again, story has such an impact in the world. And often the people it needs to reach um, who may need to see a certain message, let's say that, let's say you live somewhere where you've never met a gay person and it, and it freaks you out. And for whatever reason, you don't, you can't get your mind around the fact that 
you know, equal, that they deserve equal civil rights and the right to get married or whatever. Are you going to read a story written by a gay man or a gay woman who is, uh, you know, talking about that? Or might you be brought into that experience through someone that you might feel more comfortable reading? You know, might you read about an immigrant experience from an author with a Caucasian last name before you'd pick one up with a Mexican last name? I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but if it allows us to spread what is a a positive message and maybe open some people's minds and teach us to do a little bit better, does it matter where the message comes from? I don't know. I honestly don't know how well, I feel about this. I have, I feel, you know, I know we have a lot of um, violations against um, minority authors to make up for, and we need to give more opportunities where opportunities have not been given, and we need to make room for voices that have been edged out. But I also agree with what you're saying that it is fiction and it's creativity, and you and I don't know how you can hamper that and say what is and isn't okay to include in a fictional story. Yeah, no, I I, I don't. I think there's very little off limits there. But to the point you're making, television has changed dramatically. You can hardly turn on a TV show these days where they don't try to represent as many different people as possible. <laughs> and, you know, um, I think, yeah, it, it kind of normalizes things a little bit. And, you know, a lot of people think of somebody who is gay as, as a freak if they've never met a gay person. And when you see s- some gay people on television, you start to realize, well, you know what, they, they're really not that different than me. They're, they're just right. normal They're people. Ellen, they're Will and Grace, they're my buddies. <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're, and they're funny a lot of the time, or, or they're scurrilous a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and is that, I mean, you know, there's the argument that this is tokenism, that it's pandering. I don't know the answer, but I, I know that our ultimate end goal, hopefully all of us, is a more connected world where we can respect one another as human beings and whatever tools help get us there. I don't know that I don't know that they're a bad thing. I don't know. This is, these are big issues we got into. <laughs> yeah, and they change and they change. So um and, and also beyond television, I was just going to mention that you said you know black authors should be writing about, you know, or black issues should be we should have black authors writing about them or gay people writing about gay issues and so on and so forth. Well, the publishing industry has changed enormously as well, where they're really out there looking for much more diversity in terms of the authors that they that they sign on and so on. Yeah, I, I see a lot of improvement in that. And also not just that, but the um, the makeup of the actual staff at publishers. I yes, think, I think yes, we're trying to get true. more inclusion. So let's get to number five, ask permission. What a concept, ask permission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, When, like I've used a couple of times, I have, uh, I think the example I used was Alison Hammer, who is an author friend of mine who wrote just the most beautiful, wonderful story called Little Pieces of Me uh, about a woman who finds out her father is, her biological father is different from the man she has thought was her father all her life, which was inspired by the story a friend of hers told her. And she not only asked this woman's permission to take that idea and run with it, take that experience and run with it, but in her, I think in her acknowledgments or her author's note, she has this wonderful anecdote about what really happened and how it came about that she heard this story and what it sparked in her. And to me, that's, that's first of all, fascinating. You know, it's a behind the scenes that I think readers love, but also it felt important to me that she included her friend in all of this. She made sure it was okay with her to use that because that's very, that could be potentially sensitive, right? Yes. Yes. Um, And then she, you know, I think she included her friend in some of the marketing for the story and that made it even more fun. So yeah, just if you are using something that could be potentially sensitive, what's the ultimate end goal here, hopefully, is to maintain the relationships that you have with the people that you care about and not to hurt anybody. And so the easy way to do that, if you have the remotest doubt that something could be hurtful or potentially maybe embarrassing is to just ask the worst they can say is no. And then, you know, you're a creative, do something else and do, you know, find something that fits your story that isn't going to uh, jeopardize this relationship or hurt this person. Now, when you're reading in your capacity as a book editor, when you're reading a manuscript, you don't know whether or not they've 
taken these measures into account, but that's that's not really your job at that point. What do you find in manuscripts that you edit that is what what is kind of the customary or garden variety mistakes that people are making in their manuscripts? Oh, there is there's so many, and I don't mean everybody makes so many mistakes, but there's so many that can be commonly found. But the ones I think are most intrinsic to whether a story is as successful as it can be have to do with what I call the holy trinity, character, plot, and stakes. Um, with character, so I have these pithy little <laughs> slogans that I've kind of come up with over the years that I say about each of them. With character, I always say readers don't care what's happening until we care who it's happening to. Mm. Our job is, as authors is uh, kind of to play God. You know, we have to create these fully fleshed human beings, which is really hard, you know, to make them three dimensional and believable and give readers a reason to invest in them and care what happens to them and want to take this journey with them and make them feel real. You know, people are so complex and we have to find a way to put that on the page because if we don't, that's, I think that's the reader's vehicle into story. It doesn't necessarily have to be the human experience, but it has to be, um, I think a sentient experience I always cite uh, my octopus teacher where one of the protagonists is an octopus and he never speaks, <laughs> you know, it's an octopus, but it, a real live one, but she is a fascinating character and we invest in her because the storyteller is so skillful. We invest in her fate. We invest in her journey. So we need some sort of sentient creature through which to identify so that we can ride through the story on her back. And then stakes. And I always say, uh, if the character doesn't care profoundly, then readers don't care. And so something needs to be at risk or the character stands to gain something that is of enormous importance to that character whom we have come to care about. And then with plot, I say that uh, action is not plot and plot is not story. What I mean by that is that often I'll see stories where we have lots of great action, which is just stuff happening. But what makes it plot is that it, it's happening in the service of a character's pursuit of a clearly established goal that is important to them. So all these are tied together, right? That stakes. Um, and then what makes that story is that the character is changed by that journey in pursuit of that goal along this, uh, in the course of these actions. Do you ever get pushback from a person who is saying, you know, I'm writing an avant-garde novel here. I'm not writing <laughs> your typical structure. I, I'm not going to have a train track plot that's going to just be linear and 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 I know that you can have a strong plot without it being linear, but there are authors who want to do things differently. They want they want to experiment. They want something avant garde to, to take to market. Mm -hmm. uh, probably hard to get to get something like that published, but nonetheless, people have to write what they feel. Uh, do you? What do you do in situation? Do you run into situations like that? And if so, how how do you handle that? I think you said it probably as well as I ever could, that people have to write what they feel. This is every author's property, really. <laughs> you know, your story is your story and you get to tell it the way that you want to tell it. And if you hire an editor or often I work with publishers, our job is to help you make it as effective on the page as it can be. And if I'm working with a publisher, also to deliver whatever the con, you know, whatever idea or concept was bought by the publisher, what, you know, how it was pitched. Let's say they wanted a, you know, a thriller with romantic elements. Okay, great. Now we know what we're shooting for within that capacity. What's the author's vision and how can I help them get it on the page? You said something in the um, forensic <laughs> introduction that always makes me cringe a little bit, but I know it's really common. That, uh, that editors, there's a perception that editors tear your work apart or often that they want to take it over and make it be something, you know, that they want it to be that it isn't. And that's bad editing. A good edit holds up a mirror to the author's work and the, the editor tries to understand what the author's vision is, 
holds up the mirror and says, here's what's actually on the page, because that's a hard thing to do with your own work to get that objectivity, and says, given the vision that you, you know, that we've talked about that you are trying to convey, here's where I see that it may not be coming across as effectively as you might like it to. Here mm-hmm. are some thoughts on why that may be the case. And often I will also also offer suggestions on ways that it could be shored up. But I don't say, here's what I think should happen. I'll say things like, um, you know, one of the reasons that I feel re- maybe reader engagement drops off in the middle of the story is that we lose sight of what's at stake for the for the character. You know, middle of the story you mentioned, I, I have to tell you, I John Updike uh, was such an incredible writer. But one of the things that would happen to me, not all of his books by any means were um, really my style, but I always admired his writing. But he had books like The Witches of Eastwick, which I loved, except the first half of the book was a celebration and the second half just fell off. And I've seen that in several of his books where it's that first half and then it falls off. Now, I'm not asking you to comment on on uh, John Updike, but but I was just trying to underscore that that's kind of a uh, maybe a more common problem than I also see a lot of novels where the first 20 to 50 page, well, especially the first 20 pages or so is a celebration. And I'm thinking you have to get this to an agent who gets her fire gets lit by it. Mm -hmm. And then an editor's fire gets lit. And it seems like the, the author put all kinds of effort into those first 20 or 40 pages. And then (laughs) the the writing falls off. Then it, it defaults to the plot. And once they, and I, I'm not a fan of heavily plotted novels because they tend to um, lose the uh, wordplay. They tend to be point to point to point. And I feel like, and I'm reading for voice. I'm reading for voice. So mm-hmm. I'm very picky about that kind of stuff. My wife lo- won't read for voice. It's like, it's got to have a plot. It's got to, I've got to feel a lot of forward momentum. Anyway, I wanted to ask you about character in the arc can let's say you read a manuscript and your the protagonist is here and he's not or she's not a likable person and by the end of the manuscript still not likable is that a problem do you always need to have an arc do people need to see that there's been some progress within this person there's been some transformation or i can or you can give the reader an opportunity to go from uh feeling like this character is not anybody i want to spend real time with to I, he or she's won me over. So I think there's two uh, elements of what you said that are important and related, but not necessarily quite the same. And one is, does a character need to be likable? And the other is, does the character need to change? So let me answer them a little bit separately, and then we can mesh that as well. A character doesn't need to be likable, <laughs> in my opinion. And uh, I think in most of the industry's opinion. There's one of the examples I really enjoy. I I use a lot from TV, but just to keep it in the world of books, there's a series by Victoria Helen Stone called Jane Doe, where the hero, the heroine is a psych, like a sociopath. She's a true sociopath, kind of like Dexter, let's say. Mm -hmm. There is no real shift in her arc necessarily. There is, she's, not really likable, but she is fascinating. So we don't have to like character, but we do need a reason that we want to take a, an 80,000 or 100,000 word journey with them. And that can be a lot of different things. That can be that they're funny. It can be that they're smart. It can be that they're incredibly witty. It can be watching them that they're really good at something. It can be that they're really passionate about something. It can be Uh, just watching them win. Like I used to say, um, House of Cards was fast. I used to try to analyze why do I like House of Cards? Because there's not a single redeeming character in it. And Francis Underwood was absolutely horrible. But I loved watching him win. You know, it was, he was so good at what he did and so clever and so resourceful that that was fascinating to see. So I think there's lots of ways you can invest readers without needing to make your character likable. Do they need to change? Part of that is genre expectations. Um, you talk about loving voice. So I'm going to guess that you really like literary fiction. Yes. Yeah, which is a little lighter on plot generally. Doesn't always have yeah. necessarily big character shifts. But like you said, it's beautiful writing. It's very voicey. Um, I think it's- More, I think it more can vignettes. Draw- 
like there's a lot of vignettes yeah. really character More study like a character study almost yeah. yeah and i and you know this is a subjective industry and it's a subjective creativity is subjective one person's picasso is another person's hot mess you know but if you so, get a book like that and you understand you obviously can communicate with the author and you adjust to what that author is looking to accomplish. Yes. And there's certain rules of writing or, you know, as a reader, as an editor, and you're a reader, uh, you find, regardless of what they're trying to accomplish, you find weaknesses or things that are questionable or what have you. I'm just trying to help them get their vision across on the page as effectively and strong as possible in a way that um, it, you know, there's a gap between what we think we wrote and what we actually wrote <laughs> that mm -hmm. we can't see as authors because we're filling in all the blanks because we know the story. It's in our head. So an editor helps you, helps reflect that back to you. But a good editor is a handmaiden to the story. We're not the boss of you. <laughs> we're not, it's not our job to tell you what story you should write or how you should write it or what it, what, uh, expectations it should conform to unless Again, as we were saying, there are genre expectations, there are publisher expectations. Um, so you want to stay within those, but within those, that's still very broad. If you promised a romantic thriller, we're going to find a way to deliver a romantic thriller, but there's infinite ways to do that, that we will find the one that fits the story you want to tell. That's a good edit. We are, I always say an editor, a good editor is a midwife. It's not our baby. We didn't make the baby. We're not keeping the baby, but by God, we will help you deliver that baby. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, um, I'm interested in the logistics or the mechanics of this, how you work with an author. You're working, I suppose, with a word file, an electronic word file. Mm -hmm. And when you edit that, to begin with, what do you do up front just in terms of what do you need to know from the author before you go to work on it? And then I'm interested in knowing. When you turn that manuscript back over, marked up, how is it marked up? How do you do that? What, what, what's your <laughs> method uh, for doing that sort of thing? I started in this business so long ago that I used to, I lived in New York when I first started, and I used to go traipse to the publisher and pick up the hard copy gal or manuscript, you know, however many stack, big reams of paper, and mm -hmm. I corrected it with a, this was back when I was a copy editor, with a red pencil. And you put longer notes on post-it notes that when you brought them back to the publisher, they had to painstakingly take them off so that they could Xerox the manuscript and then put them all back in. Um, <laughs> so now, yeah, track changes was a game changer. And that's basically how most editors work now. We So the first thing I do when I get a manuscript, um, I always call it feeling the story. There's no way I can help an author actualize her vision on the page until I know what her vision is. And the best way for me to begin to understand that is to read the story. So the first thing I do is read it like a novel. I don't worry about editing. I don't really make a lot of notes. I, I put it on my Kindle actually, and I just read it. And that plants my feet in the story. And then I go back in and I do the deep edit. And the first, uh, as I'm going through that first pass, that first deep pass, I make my embedded comments which are in track changes, where I have an idea from the first read what may not, I, I kind of know what the author wants to accomplish. If I don't, I'll arrange a call with the author, um, like I'm working on one right now, where the story could go one of several directions, but the things that aren't working as well as they could are the things that aren't working as well as they could. You know, it's the stakes, it's developing the character arcs. So I can identify where it's not as effective as it could be, but there's lots of different ways to address it. And I'm not quite sure what this author's intention is. So it would ha be helpful for me to talk to her and get a sense of what that is. And then I can pinpoint my feedback to help her achieve that. So I do the embedded comments. And as I'm doing that, I'm also jotting notes in a separate document that are kind of the big picture things. Like, like I was just saying, like I'll say stakes, 
are low throughout and could use shoring up. And then in the embedded comments, I'm developing those ideas and I'm showing specifically where those observations occurred to me and why. Like, okay, here we don't see in this scene what what her immediate goal is. So we don't know what her ultimate goal is or how that's going to get her closer to her ultimate goal. And so that's impacting momentum. So that's the specific note. And then in the overview note, which is in the separate document, I would talk about just in general, you know, where the stakes feel a little bit low and ways that we might look to make them clearer to the reader. And we may do and that, three passes of that. We may do six passes of that. We just keep kind of circling in closer and closer on every pass. We start with the big picture issues and then we work, work our way into like micro edit issues and then down to line edit issues and the voice and just hopefully polish that sucker right up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's talk about your own writing. Uh, you, I, I do, you, are you an editor and you're a writer simultaneously? I mean, do you set aside a part of the day for your own writing and then you're doing your editing another piece of the day? I do. So I started writing as soon as I knew how to write and what language was. My first book was an autobiography that I wrote on construction paper and bound in yarn. And it was called, <laughs> really embarrassingly for an editor, my autobiography about me, I wrote it myself. So it was a little <laughs> bit redundant. How old um, were you? Oh, gosh. I must have been six. Wow. Something like, yeah, I still so have it. Very early in life, you wanted to write. You know, there was a voice inside of you busting, busting to get out. Or so I thought. And so for years, I thought I was going to be a writer, and then I became an actor, and then I came back to writing. But I had started editing in the early 90s, one million years ago. And I did it because I was an actor at the time, and I could work from anywhere and freelance with all the I was working with the big six at the time in New York and not live like a starving artist, which was nice. And then it turned out as the years went on, I realized that I, turns out, am an editor to my soul. And so that's my first love. I, it's weird. Like, I don't know any wow. other writer editors who say that. They always say writing is their first love and editing is sort of the, you know, the day job that pays the bills. But I, I love editing more than really anything. I love it so much. Well, and so I still go. write, but my mornings are for writing or for whatever I'm working on. My afternoons are for doing actual editing work, but often my mornings, sometimes they will be fiction writing, but uh, I wrote a book on editing called Intuitive Editing, for example, and I do a lot of writing about editing and I do a lot of writing about writing and I do a lot of teaching about writing. And so often my mornings will be developing courses or developing ideas or writing blog posts or articles, or I'm working on a second book now. And I should probably say, um, it was interesting. You said this in the opening about, I think you said Julia Cameron or uh, somebody said that yeah, they Julia wouldn't, Cameron. would yeah. not trust but, an that, editor. And who that was my author. point with you. That was my point with you when I was telling our listeners that you're a writer, you're somebody who's writing. And so you're not, pent up and frustrated. You don't have this extreme sensor inside that won't even let you sit down to write because it's too tor it's, it's too torturous. <laughs> so you're not going to um, uh, torture uh, people who come to you for your services as a book editor. So Julia well, Cameron would say that you're you're doing you're you're in the right position where you're writing and editing. <laughs> Well, two things about that. One, funny enough, I kept so, so Phoebe Fox is a pseudonym. And my editing is under my real name, which is Tiffany Yates Martin. And I kept those two completely separate up until about a year ago because I didn't want the authors I work with as an editor to feel that they came second to my writing. And then uh, I was so afraid to merge them. To, I, I was so afraid what writers would think and would they take me seriously as an editor if you know they didn't maybe like what I wrote or my genre. And f it was fear-based, honestly in addition to the reason which was valid about wanting to keep it separate. And so I merged them and I was so afraid of what author, how authors would view it. But as you say, it, it was nothing but positive. Like everybody really felt that that gave me a little bit more perspective into their side of the page. But I, I do strongly believe. I mean, if, yeah. And I hear that a, a lot. Here's a book novelist. It's like, she's, she's out there. She's, uh, she's made it. And that's the kind of person I want 
you know, looking, looking at my work because she obviously knows, knows uh, what works. But honestly, what I, thank you, but what I, everything that makes me, I think a good writer, I learned as an editor, not as a writer. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I, I always say that I, not every writer is a good editor. Not every editor is a good writer. And that's okay. They're different skills. Editing is very analytical and it requires a deep knowledge of story craft and a very analytical brain. And writing is much more creative. And that's a helpful, it's helpful if you are in touch with both sides of your brain, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a great writer. Any more than a great, like Steven Spielberg, nobody knows him for his acting, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Steven Seagal is trying to direct. I don't think anybody's lining up for that. <laughs> great coaches are not always great be. football players, right? Right, right. <laughs> of course, I don't or know how many of us are lining up for his acting either. No <laughs> <Yes>. offense. <laughs> um, so I, I think they're different skills. I don't necessarily agree with Julia Cameron. <laughs> Who am I to disagree with Julia Cameron? But there it is. I, I think that you don't necessarily, being good at one doesn't necessarily mean you're good at the other one. Yes, 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 yes. Now, but here's the thing. Here you are, editor first. You love editing. It's informed your writing and so on. You sit down to write. Doesn't that powerful internal editor of your of yours assault your writing efforts? Yes, that internal editor is a son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, what do you what do you do to put her in her place? Well, the funny is thing there, is, is I, there a technique you use that to 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 uh, yeah? You know, there's there's kind of these mental frameworks people talk about, and and you know, wait in the corner. It's not your time yet, sort of thing. <laughs> that was the hardest thing I had to learn as a writer. Actually, it hampered my writing enormously. Especially the more I realized that I, that uh, editing was kind of my my soul. <laughs> it it is my default setting, and so it was very hard. I kept wanting to churn out a perfect thing on my first draft, which is just death to your creativity. And then you've constantly got this left brain analytical mean voice, you know, in your ear telling, judging everything you write while you write it and totally shutting you down. You need the freedom to suck when you're drafting. You need the freedom to make egregious mistakes and find your way and flail about and sound stupid. And that was really hard. It's, it, you know, it's, this is silly, but I, minored in Spanish and I used to speak it much better, but over the years I haven't had an opportunity to speak it until I moved to Texas. But then I became sort of frightened to speak it because it, it's funny, you talked earlier about using the exact right word. I, I'm an editor, I'm a writer. That's what I want to do. I feel like I am very expressive in the way I communicate because I have all the words, <laughs> you know, I can say the exact word I want. And in Spanish, I sound like a child. And so it, I freeze up. I am afraid to speak to people because I'm afraid I sound like an idiot. And, and that's in a weird way. I think that's similar to what we do to ourselves when we're first drafting. We're afraid to sound like an idiot, but we forget that no one ever has to see this until we're ready for them to. And that writing is just, I always say it's the first base camp on Mount Everest. It is a big part of the process, these writing skills that we have. But drafting is just step one. The main work, this is another reason I love editing, the main work and the main magic of creating a story happens in revision and editing. That's when you deepen. It's when you look really deep into what you already have. It's when you develop it. It's when you clarify your ideas. It's when you make it pretty. This is the fun part for me, and it's the meaty part, and it's where every book you've ever loved has been, I'm pretty willing to promise, has been very thoroughly edited by its author and revised and rewritten. Yeah. Yeah. But you're now, seeing the final product and you're judging your first draft against it. Exactly. And you know, Jennifer Egan, a Pulitzer Prize winner for a visit uh, from the Goon Squad, uh, was I heard on a radio interview where she, they said, Tell us about how you, your writing process. And she said, Well, I write a chapter. And of course, it's terrible. <laughs> and and Anne Lamott said in her book Bird by Bird, which is an excellent writing book, that all these all those authors out there that you want to emulate or that you cherish or that you think are just phenomenally talented, they all write lousy first drafts. It's not about that first draft. It's about working with that, mm -hmm. with the, with the, allowing yourself, like you're saying, allowing yourself the input 
or the, excuse me, the output so that when you give yourself that free, the freedom to write badly, you also get gems out of that. And then you just, you, do. you just rake away the, the, the dross and you work with the, with the jewels and, and start uh, fashioning them into the proper form. So yeah. let me ask, go ahead. Did you want to add to that? No, I, yeah, I wanted- uh, that's, that's as good as I could have expressed it. I joke in my book in intuitive editing, uh, write like a dog, edit like a cat. <laughs> That's basically what you just said. Like, let yourself access all the magic of the creative brain that is just kind of like ah, slobbery and (laughs) uncontrolled. And then you come in with that cool feline calculation. And that's when you you get to, that's when you get to develop those ideas and pretty them up. Now, uh, I want our listeners to know in the program notes below, um, I will have the list of Phoebe's novels. I will have both of our guests' names uh, so that you can, for both of purposes, editor and writer, uh, and also her, her website, uh, uh, URL for the website address. So uh, the, you've, got, you've got that information. So the latest novel that you wrote, Phoebe, is called The Way We Weren't, as I said at the top of the program. And uh, uh, we're going to have you read an excerpt from that. But first, I want to ask you, what is the... Uh, What's the origin of the book? I mean, what inspired it? I, this was the first full-length fiction I ever tried writing 15 years ago, and it has taken me that long to kind of figure out what the book was. But it started with what is still a central sort of image in the story, which is a woman flees her life and winds up passed out on the beach and a misanthropic old man finds her and picks her up. And the two of them develop an unlikely alliance that winds up pushing them into um, facing some things in their past that they've both gotten stuck in. That stayed the same. Everything else changed really (laughs) because Mm -hmm. I started, it it was too much story for me to take on as a little baby novelist before I had the skills that I needed to do it. And honestly, before I had the life experience, because it's uh, what wound, what winds up in the final version that got published spurring her to leave her life is that uh, Marcy, my, one of my two protagonists, she and her husband, who have been married very happily for 20 years, very very happily childless for 20 years, they didn't choose it, but it happened and they were perfectly content with it, suddenly find themselves pregnant uh, right as their biological window is closing. And they find themselves on completely opposite sides of the issue. And it throws them into a crisis that Marcy never foresaw in their very happy marriage. And it wind- she winds up fleeing from that. And I when I started writing this, I, I wasn't married. <laughs> I had never really seriously thought about having children. I don't think I had the emotional depth to take these things on. And I didn't really know what the story was. I had this interesting idea and these interesting characters, but it wasn't enough, you know, as you and I were talking about earlier, or well, I guess it's enough for literary fiction, but <laughs> that's not what I was writing. I would have so, taken it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and that's what I tried to do at first. I was writing it sort of more in a literary vein, but that really isn't the kind of writer that I am. So I had to figure out what story I wanted to tell and what journey I wanted to send these two on. So I just, I have probably rewritten this thing, God, from the ground up, maybe three to four times at least. And that doesn't count all the just little revisions I did along the way. I'll bet you I have more than a hundred thousand discarded word, hundred thousand discarded words on this thing. Um, but what really, when I really found the core of it was when I met my husband and, and at 39 and 45 respectively, I'd never been married and suddenly had found someone I wanted to share my life with. And that biological window was closing and we had to decide <laughs> really immediately whether we were going to have children or not. Another it suddenly became autofiction. A, a little bit. Autobiographical fiction. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't, this I isn't mean, but it happened in reverse. It happened in reverse, it sounds like. Maybe. Is that what ended up happening? It, it's with not you really our pregnant? story at all. It, it just, oh, okay. the, the idea of, you know, we finally made the decision not to have kids because we, uh, we wanted to have a marriage first and, and we didn't really have the time to do both. And it was as hard a decision as I've ever made. And I, and we got through that together on, you know, we were on the same side of it ultimately. And I thought, what if you weren't? 
What if like, I love my husband dearly. I, I have been incredibly happy with him for 15 years. What if you couldn't find common ground on something that foundational? What would happen? And that's what we were talking about earlier, right? Our jobs as storytellers is the what if. So I just sort of took that and ran with it. And that was when the book finally found its feet and really came to life. So did it come quickly by time you found its feet? Did you feel like the uh, writing uh, accelerated or it came together pretty quickly? <laughs> How long? It, I mean, it was, once you sat down and really started working on it again after you had put it on the on ice for what years it sounds like, um, then what, what length of time did it take to finish it? it? It was the most agonizing 15 years of labor you could imagine because it, it, it didn't stay on ice all that time. It came out and I'd poke at it again and I'd, I think I got it and I'd send it to my agent and you know, this book helped me get an agent, but it wasn't there yet. And so I'd redo it and send it to her. Nope, still not there. And then I'd put it away for a while. And then later I'd take it out and I'm like, oh, I got it this time. And I would redo it painstakingly and still not there. This last time when I, uh, when we got the offer from Penguin Berkeley, they bought a little bit of grace, which was the first in my two book deal with them. And then they said, what do you have for a second book? And I had three works in progress. One of them was this and I pitched it to them and they loved it. And that was awesome because I loved this story so much and desperately wanted to see it in print. But also uh, the pressure was on at that point because I'm a deadline girl. You give me a deadline and, and an obligation that I commit to and by God, it's going to happen. And then it finally did come quickly. But my God, Mike, it took me 15 years of just agonizing childbirth labor to get to that point. And then finally, wow. the sucker came out. <laughs> wow. That's a great story. So really, speaking of I'm that, glad because it wasn't so much living. Well, <laughs> you know, you were committed to it. You committed and, and it had to incubate for a long, long time. It did. And just find the right audience. And it, it, you know, it almost sounds like here you got this other book published and then they just wanted more from you. It's like, we like this. What else you got? You get, you tell them what it is and they got excited about it. And that felt um, really good, especially because this one has always been extremely close to my heart. And I, I so badly wanted to share it with readers, but it, it just, I had, at that point I had kind of accepted it was never going to happen. So it was such a gift that that was the one that my editor was interested in. Thank you, Cindy Huang. There you go. Um, so Let's have you share some right now, if you would read an excerpt from The Way We Weren't. I'd love to. I will tell you that I uh, I was just listening to the audio book for the first time, and the two narrators that, that we picked for the book are so stinking good that now I'm rather daunted trying to read this myself, but I'm going to do we it. We haven't listened yet, so uh, <laughs> This good. is the first chapter of The Old Man's Perspective, Herman Flint. The drunk was still there when the sun went down, still lying on the sand in the same position as far as he could tell when he thought to look out his window again, probably strung out too. Seemed like the whole town was buying or selling drugs these days. What the hell was it about beaches that made people want to fornicate or pass out on them or both? This morning, he'd leaned over to pick up a Slim Jim wrapper and an empty beer bottle and put them in the plastic bag he'd long ago taken to carrying with him on his early morning walks along the beach, before the sun rose, before the people came. When his foot hit something solid amid the amorphous mass of clothing lumped on the sand and he'd realized what it was, he'd only barely restrained his impulse to prod the body with his shoe. Over 70 years he'd been here, except for three of them, where he'd been in an even worse shit pile. And of all that had changed, what he noticed most was the trash. They always left it, the tourists. He spit the word in his mind like an epithet. But over the years, it had evolved. When he was a kid, he'd found wrappers from Necco wafers and Love Nest bars, Byerly's orange drink bottles and condoms, each piece like a character in a story telling him something about the person who'd cast it off. He'd try to picture each item in use, who'd been using it, who they were with, where they came from. Then it was fun dip and space dust envelopes, Fanta grape cans and condoms, now seeming less interesting, not pieces of a mystery, but useless remnants of lives left behind for someone else to clean up. Later, empty sandwich bags and plastic six-pack rings and pop tabs and condoms. Then bottle caps and more condoms. 
long after it had ceased to matter what the garbage was and who had left it, only that they had and littered his beach. In the early afternoon, he'd poured the remainder of his fourth cup of coffee into the kitchen sink as he stared through the window at the drunk, still crumpled on the sand beneath the stippled shade of a palm tree. Coffee was about the greatest beverage in the world, with two or three piquant and forbidden exceptions, but after enough of it, the tongue grew bitter and coated and the stomach rebelled. When the appeal of coffee paled was still the gut-wrenching time of day he'd kill his child for a sweet scotch on the rocks, so to speak. That's probably enough. <laughs> Bravo. That was very visual. Thanks. That was actually that scene was one of the few that survived every iteration of this story. There's just something about these two, this man finding this woman passed out and their lives intersecting that has fascinated me for 15 years. It's so weird. Yeah. And now it manifests. That's yeah, part of the so magic amazing. of writing, isn't it? When, when you, you have an idea and you have a character. And I was <laughs> saying to somebody else I had on the program that people don't realize who don't write um, how real these characters become, that that you're a creator. And these people mm -hmm. become very real after you've worked with them for a long time, certainly for 15 years. <laughs> and they've <laughs> in, entered adolescence uh, or teenage, the teen, teenage years. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a process. So um, what is your uh, writing life like? I want to know, you're writing in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, do you put a specific number of hours, uh, commit yourself to a specific number of hours? Are you one of those people who say, I'm going to write a minimum of X number of words per day? Um, what's your, what's your benchmark? What are your benchmarks? I love parameters and I need them. So when I'm writing fiction, often I'll give myself a word count and it's usually a thousand words a day, or I'll give myself, you must finish this scene. You must finish this chapter. Um, and when I'm writing nonfiction, like about writing, generally, if I'm doing, let's say, a blog post, I like to try to finish a full blog post in one day or two days. If I'm working on, like I'm working on the follow-up book for intuitive editing right now, I may take one concept, like I'm, this one is about character building. And so let's say I'll take assumptions and I'll, and I'll think, okay, I just want to finish this whole section where I talk about assumptions and how to use them in your writing to create tension in characters. So I, I need either an objective or an actual word count. And, but I also have a hard time limit. So that's, you know, it's within that, you know, I, I so work a full work day. To keep your fingers going. You, you work right at a keyboard or do you handwrite? I write at a keyboard, but I had to teach myself to do that because I was a handwriter for years and years and years. And now the idea of that feels impossibly slow. My understanding is you walked away from a book contract um, at mm -hmm. one point. Tell us about that. Why do you do that when everybody is struggling to get one? I walked away at the 11th hour, actually. I pulled the book, which was terrifying. Um, I had, so with my first publisher, it was a small press and they were great for my first four books in the breakup doctor series. You mentioned three of them. One has gone out of print for the time being. And I'd been really happy with them for that. And we were contracted for the fifth book, but our, um, interests diverged. And so I realized I, I did not feel that it was going to, this was a little bit of grace. And I, I was worried that that my intentions for the book didn't match what I thought the small press was bringing to it. And so I pulled it like months before publication with no, no contract, no nothing. I thought the book was dead. And so my agent shopped it around, but we didn't really initially get a lot of, we, we had no reason to think that we were going to get another book deal after that. And right when I thought that one was kind of dead in the water, we got the offer from Berkeley. So it was funny. I call it one random yes, not to make a play on words about Penguin Random. But <laughs> there was one day when I thought, oh my God, I've I've left my press and I I don't have anything to look at in the future as far as my next book. And I'm back at square one. And this could be this is the end of my career. 
I'm, you know, I'm done. And then literally the next day we got a call from Berkeley with the offer and I got everything I'd ever wanted as an author. And I tell authors this all the time. We, I think we get so hung up on all the rejection that we start to take it really personally and we may doubt ourselves and we may lose hope. We may lose our confidence. And yet there's this there's just, it's one random yes. It's one subjective person's interest in your story that they convince a few other subjective people to take a chance on it. And they give you a yes, but on a different day, they might have given you a different answer. A different publisher might have given you a different answer. A different person might have. And in no way is your work any different or your worth any different. Mm -hmm. So it was just a really valuable lesson to me on defining my letting myself define myself as a writer internally rather than based on external metrics, like whether I get a publishing contract. That, that has no bearing on how good my work is. So you've been involved in the writing and publishing business for about 30 years. Yeah. You've seen changes in the industry over those 30 years. How have author opportunities shifted over the, the past three decades? What have you seen? I love how democratized the industry has become. If you want your story to reach readers, by God, you can get your story out to readers. And that's lovely. It also comes with <laughs> a dark side where, you know, you, there's literally millions of books in print that we are all competing with every time we publish a book. There are uh, small presses that are more diligent than others in turning out a product that is that is up to a certain standard. And so there's a lot of variation among that. There's the temptation to put something out before you've really done your due diligence on it. And, you know, writing is hard. <laughs> the whole process is really hard. And there's a reason that if you get a contract with a publisher, it's going to take like a year and a half or more to get your book into print. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of stages it has to go through, not just for the book itself, for the story itself, but with the marketing, um, with the distribution, with the publicity for it. And all of that takes time. And I think it's tempting to skip over some of that as a self-published author and sometimes small press author. So it comes with good and bad things. But I think if we educate ourselves about the industry, we can use a lot of this to our favor as authors, and it gives us more control over our careers than we may ever have had before. It also puts more responsibility in the author's lap than we've ever had before. You know, a lot of us mourn, not that I was alive during the Max Perkins era. He was my one of my editing idols. He edited Fitzgerald and Hemingway and um, so many others. And he, and that was back, you know, that romanticized view of the author just writes the book. You're the artist and you create the art and then they take care of everything else for you. <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about these silly mm -hmm. business concerns like marketing and all. Well, now you have to be, you have to be a Renaissance person. You have to be a great artist and you also have to be a great business person. And you have to find the time to not only write the book and hone the book and make it the best it can be, but you have to figure out formatting. You have to figure out cover if you're indie publishing. You also have to learn how to market. You have to learn how to present yourself. You have to be a public speaker. You have to <laughs> write all these blog posts. You have to do all this publicity. And so I think it's a lot more complicated than it used to be too. Yeah. Much and, and there's so many writers who, to them, that's anathema. The yeah. last thing they want to do is be sending out tweets or <laughs> or doing a uh, TikTok video or what have you. Uh, that's just not that's that's not their gig. And it's not um, necessarily a skill mo that all creatives have. Exactly. And there's exactly. nothing wrong with that, except that in the present environment, you better develop it. So that's tough. Mm. It is. Now, uh, why do I wrap up by having you? Tell us a little bit more about your forthcoming book. I do, do you have a title and what and can, can you talk about what it is, what the um, story is about, or is that are you superstitious or is that just undercover right now? Well, I am not superstitious, but uh, I don't talk about fiction while I'm writing it because if I do, I stop wanting to write it. I have to just let it percolate in my head. So I do have one that I'm kind of working on, but it hasn't been. I haven't talked to my publisher about it yet, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with that one. The one I'm that's in the I have the front brain book and sort of the 
back burner book. That's my back burner book right now. The front brain book is the follow-up editing book, which is called Intuitive Character Development. And that is doing a really deep dive into how to create fully fleshed, rounded, three-dimensional characters that feel real to readers. That one I'll talk about all day because that's super fun. (laughs) Like I could talk about my nonfiction all the time. It just helps me work out the theories. (laughs) We're well over an hour, so I'll wrap up. But I have to tell you, Phoebe, I knew I was going to have fun, and I did. I really enjoyed talking with you. You're you're just a great personality, and you've done so many things. And I really appreciate how open you've been during during the whole conversation. So thank you for taking the time and coming on the program. Thanks, Mike. You you mentioned that you just like it to feel sort of conversational and warm, and it does. It's really this was a really fun conversation for me too. So thanks. <laughs> 